So why don't we move on? And uh, Jennifer, what do you think of this case? So we have a three-year-old male with elbow pain and mild swelling for 10 days. Um, let's see. So we see the ossification center of the capitellum, which is normal for this age. Of course, the other ossification centers are not yet present. Um, Fusion, yeah. Okay, so here. Uh, uh, Jennifer. Yes. And it's me again. Um, if you don't, what is it? Three, three months of age. Three years. Three. No, it says months, I think. Three-year-old male. Oh, a three-year-old male. Okay, I'm sorry. Now, if it's a three-year-old male, doesn't it depend on, on development of a, of a child, whether or not ossification centers are present? Yes, so first you have the capitellar ossification center, which we can see here. Right. And then next you'll have the radial head, which is usually age five. So right now he only has one, and the rest are cartilaginous. So basically what we're talking about is that that this elbow, in terms of uh, um, growth, is normal. This looks appropriate, yes. Right. So now we're looking for a trauma or whatever. Yes. And Thank we... you very much. Well, we didn't see a fat pad sign previously. Um, I don't see any evidence of physial widening. There's a little fluid surrounding that proximal radius, and it looks like there's some mild marrow edema. Um, what, is that, what is that thing in the joint that you saw? Um, is that something on the, on the right there? Go to the radial, yeah, right, the radial capitellar joint. What, what is that thing? I'm not sure if that's part of the... Oh, listen, I'm the orthopedic surgeon, and I, this kid is having pain. I don't know where the pain is, but uh, uh, let's say it's on a lateral side. So what? what is that? I, I'm not sure if this could be a tear of the lateral, lateral ligament. Um, a tear of a ligament in this age? No, probably not. No. Maybe this. Uh, that would be child abuse. Uh, you know, you, you, um, there you go. Now, now see, uh, Dr. Cruz just really blew it for us. <laughs> I'm kidding. No, I, I, this is a very strange condition. Um, and, then, and we probably don't see most of these in the MRI room. Yeah. Do you? Uh, no, no, I don't. I don't remember ever making this diagnosis on MR. But what there you go, and then and there's, uh, you got me too. I never saw it on MR. But uh, th this is really an injury to the to the radius, and it, excuse me, and the uh, these stabilizing uh, soft tissue structures around the radial head because it's pulled, and we can see that there's a lot of edema and soft tissue thickening and these structures right around the radial head, including the area where we'd see the, the annular ligament. And this may be a little lateral plica that's accepted. Uh, that's what I was thinking. But in this age group, I've never seen a plaque in my life. Have you? No, and so I think that they're implying that this is part of the trauma, uh, kind of a tear of the capsule, and part of it becomes unstable in this flipped <laughs> space. Now, capsular injuries are uh, bad news, and and um, because the capsule is is very important structure on the lateral side. Right, and, and that's why these kids can have chronic pains, is because they get they get damaged to the capsule, which is important for the stability of the lateral side. Well, you uh, the, uh, these are re reducible 
it takes a little trick uh, uh, an orthopedic training and you can reduce these right away yeah. uh, and they go popping back in and, 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 and everything is fine but the main thing is I, I still see people doing this and it's pretty nauseating to, to see somebody pick up a two-year-old or a three-year-old um, by the, the hand and the, usually the parents are doing it not the nurses and nurses don't do that anymore right and what happens is that the, the radial head is pulled distally which allows the annular ligament to fold over the the distal end of the radius and extends into the articulating surface here. So that's what we're looking at, right? And that's what we're looking at over here. Yeah, so that that is not a plica, and that is probably the yeah. uh, the ligament. Yeah, right. Yeah, hey, uh, that, that that was a that's a fascinating case. i like I said, I, yeah, you can that's past 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 my time of taking yeah. care of kids. Yeah. Yeah, this is Dr. Another one of the many great cases we have from Dr. Sue. That's a very interesting case. Yeah. So well, let's move on to the medial side, and this is more the side where athletes get injuries. <clears throat> uh, and we can see the deep ligamentous structures here, the uh, three components of the ulnar collateral ligament here, the anterior, posterior, and transverse. And the anterior, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about because it's important in overhead throwing athletes, which you you already are well aware. And then external to that again are the tendons, the common flexor tendon attachments, uh, which we'll talk about here. Of which on this side, there are primarily two: the pronator teres and the flexor, flexor digitorum superficialis. Uh, that anterior one is the most important one, isn't it, John? Yes, right here. Right. Yeah. And then just another example, here the biceps coming down, attaching to the radial head. And then if you come out here, uh, you can see the anterior band of the ulnar collateral ligament, posterior band, oblique band. Uh, and it's really this anterior band that we're going to be talking about. And it goes from the medial epicondyle down to the sublime tubercle. Again, of which you're all already familiar with. So this is what it looks like on an MR examination. Now, typically the coronal plane images uh, image it uh, obliquely, so you typically don't see it on one image like we're seeing here. It's it's nice if you do, but if you do see it on one image and it's a good coronal plane and you have nice thin cut images, it may mean that you have a subluxed elbow. So so don't get too cocky if you see that. Uh, uh, normally, we'll see the distal end uh, attach anteriorly. I mean, uh, yeah, anteriorly, and then we'll we'll have to go to the next cuts more posteriorly to see its origin from the from the medial epicondyle here. In this case, uh, or, uh, yep. Uh, are, are you going to talk about uh, what we talked about earlier about lateral versus medial? Oh, go, go ahead, John. You 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 tell ever, tell us all about that. Oh, that that's the latest stuff I read. I, I never knew this before. Um, I suspected, but I didn't know. Uh, on the lateral side, most of the um, stability is due to the bone and cartilage um, and capsule. Ninety uh, percent. Or thereabouts, depending on whether the elbow is flexed or extended. If it's flexed, it's nine nine percent um, uh, ligaments. If it's extended, then it's uh, maybe fifteen percent. On the medial side, uh, most of the um, uh, structure is also uh, due to bone and cartilage in terms of stability, but also the capsule and the ligaments. They split it about 50-50. So uh, that's very important. And the most important structure in terms of stability happens to be the oblique band. But all these are capsule and ligaments. We should never forget a capsule, how important it is around the elbow. Probably that is why with the structure of the bone and the cartilage, um, Dislocated elbows almost never recur, 2% only. Um, and the treatment for these are a little 
complex, so we won't get into that and, and, until John wants to, to do it. So um, that's about all I can tell you. Great. Excellent. Thank you. Thank, thank you. So let's talk about the ulnar collateral ligament injuries. Uh, as George is saying, they it can occur anywhere along the chorus. Uh, they commonly tear at the sub sublime tubercle insertion. They can also tear approximately from the medial epicondyle, mid-substance tears, and then uh, distal tears. Uh, so, and again, we've gone through the, kind of the mechanism, the valgus load here. Uh, in the throwing position, the cocking position, you've got distraction uh, anter uh, anteromedially and impaction laterally. And this can, over time, cause tearing of that uh, anterior, that, that medial stabilizer, which is the anterior band of the ulnar collateral ligament. Commonly occurs, as you, again, all know in pictures. And uh, so that's called a valgus injury. Now, it can happen acutely, but most of the time when we see it in sports, it's due to chronic repetitive overuse. All right. So, uh, Ashley, what do you think of this case? Okay, so we have a uh, valgus injury here. We can see extensive bone marrow contusion uh, along the uh, medial aspect, uh, some impaction injury there uh, along the medial aspect of the distal humerus. Wait, wait, medial. Uh, Which side is medial? Which side is lateral? Oh, sorry, uh, sorry, lateral, lateral side. That's the radial side, yes, sorry. Here's the lateral aspect. Of yeah, here's there. A, yeah, this is the capitellum. So we have an impaction injury here with a lot of trabecular bone injury. And then on the medial side, on the medial side, it looks like there's some tearing of that um, common flexor tendon, and uh, the old, I, I don't know. If well, uh, maybe there is a common flexor tendon. We're not in a great position for that, but what we can see here, this is the ulnar collateral ligament. Yeah, it looks it's, torn. You have a lot of increased sigil, and there's a lot of edema around it. So you might yeah. also have an injury to the to the tendon and muscle as well. Okay, so that's impaction, that's a distraction injury, and that's a typical, this is more of an acute uh, valgus injury to the elbow. Okay, Michael. Uh, Michael? Yep. Um, let's bring back that other one. Okay, well, that's Ashu's case. All right. Um, what we want to know is, is this stable or unstable clinically? If it is stable clinically, you get the patient back to activity um, early on. But with all this injury, I would immobilize this patient for a week or two and then start activity and, and um, either supervised or whatever. Um, if it's stable. If it's not stable, then activity has to be uh, markedly reduced and the patient has to be immobilized for a considerable length of time. And of course, if the instability persists, uh, you know what happens. We'll be talking about that. Okay. Good job. All right. Thank you. Michael. Michael? Yep. All right, so 15-year-old male, baseball pitcher, rule out ulnar collateral ligament tear versus stress reaction. Okay, so the interior band of the ulnar collateral ligament looks like it's, I think it looks like it's grossly intact. There's a little bit of increased signal kind of on the inner aspect of those fibers right there. So maybe it's like a partial tear. Okay, so. It looks like there's still some fibers attaching to the, the humerus. Okay, so there may be a little signal there. We do see but I'm worried about the that fat signal, that kind of triangle that you're just outlining. Like if it's, it's hard to see on the stir image, but I don't know if that's just fat, but it almost kind of looks like trabecular bone in a way. Well, this is fat. So, that's a normal fat pad. There. That's just a normal fat pad. Okay. If you don't see it, that's an that's, uh, that's abnormal. So, yeah, and I think we've talked about that before where we've dictated a effacement of that fat pad. Right. Oh, hold on. Hold on real quick, Dr. Lee. Sorry, there's a procedure, but Dr. Lee will do it. 
Oh, okay. It's, uh, it's scrolled on Jackson, so. Okay. So we can see that we do see the fat pad here. Uh, if you don't see the fat pad there, that's abnormal. It doesn't necessarily mean you have an acute tear, uh, but it, it, it typically in overhead throwing athletes means that you've got scarring or something in this area. So it means that the ulnar collateral ligament is probably not normal. It doesn't necessarily mean it's surgical. If we go to the the fluid sensitive images, we see a little bit of increased signal intensity, but proximally you can get splaying of the ulnar collateral ligament. Um, but we do see some edema on both sides of the ligament, uh, which is it's not normal. And then if we go to the sagittal images, what we can see here is here's the ulnar collateral ligament and also some of the tendon coming down there, and we can see some edema in this particular area. So. Uh, these kind of findings where it looks like it's intact, but we can see evidence of abnormal tissue injury in this area is typically called grade one ulnar collateral ligament sprains, in this case with the little soft tissue edema around it. Um, some of the literature uh, of people that have taken, I, I couldn't believe how many operations some of these people have done, uh, 700. Um, I didn't know there were that many elbows in the world uh, to, to operate. But anyway, uh, that, that, that's kind of a facetious comment, obviously. Right. Um, it takes two millimeters at the time of surgery of, val of, um, of opening of the joint medially uh, to go on with um, um, repair. Okay. So and all it takes is two millimeters. Okay. Um, anything underneath that uh, or below that, you don't operate. Good, good. So I would uh, obviously check that before surgery, and you can do that with a stress um, um, on x-ray. Yep. But uh, you guys uh, have the advantage because you can see the ligaments flopping in the wind. Right, yep. So these grade ones are typically non-surgical. <clears throat> But uh, but they do uh, require a while to heal, or they're at risk for for re-injury, and we'll sh we'll see some of those in a minute. Okay, uh, Jennifer. Okay, so this is a 13-year-old female with three weeks of elbow pain after injury. Um. On these radiographs, I do not see a displaced fracture or a fusion, but okay, so here we can see that there's diffuse increased signal intensity within that ulnar collateral ligament attachment to the humerus, so it looks like at least partial thickness tearing, also some increased signal intensity within the flexor, common flexor tendon. So I'd be concerned or strained. Okay. Oh, mm -hmm. Okay. So here I don't see a tear of the common flexor tendons. It's probably some muscle strain, but there is, I think, some partial thickness tearing of that ulnar collateral ligament. And you can see that this is a valgus treatment. But you wouldn't rush into surgery there, would you? Would I? <laughs> no. What I mean is, to, you, you wouldn't. Well, as an orthopedic surgeon, this is a case of putting a patient in an immobilization and see what happens down the road. Yeah. Uh, acute repairs on these is, uh, I don't remember ever doing one. Yeah. No, and I just don't do that. The other thing to remember is that normal people do just fine without an intact ulnar collateral ligament. Precisely. It's it's just the high level throwing athletes that require an ulnar collateral ligament, and uh, but we'll talk more about that when we get to athletic injuries. Uh, so right, yeah, I don't think that this would be surgical. Okay, uh, Ashu. All right, so looking here, <clears throat> um, it looks like there is increased signal along the course of the ulnar collateral ligament uh, proximally. Um, 
and uh, quite a bit of increased signal there. I think there might be some partial tearing. There might be some increased edema. Also noted the uh, distal humerus right there. Yeah, so um, I kind of would like to scroll through it. And there's there's some impaction, contusion injury along the um, the lateral aspect of the humerus as well. Okay, so this looks like another valgus mechanism of injury. So let's mm -hmm. see what it looks like two years later. This is what it looks like two years later. Hmm. It looks like that ulnar collateral ligament now is, is completely torn and retracted. You can kind of see a fragment there, um, right there. Yeah, I think it's completely torn. And um, you can actually see some bone, bony remodeling along the lateral aspect of the humerus. I think this is just chronic impaction um, there, and they just continue to um, to play. Yeah, and then this patient had another uh, injury, and you can see that the distal tear of the uh, ulnar collateral ligament at its insertion to the sublime tubercle, uh, tear of the pronator teres here, and then we can see a valgus impaction injury here. Also. When you say an injury, John, it was, did the kid fall or did it, was it a, some kind of throwing injury? I don't remember, John, I'm sorry. Okay, I mean, this looks like probably a fall. Yeah, good good question. I, I would guess that also. This it, this doesn't look like the kind of injury I expect to see from throwing. I think it's probably a fall uh, on the outside. That's a lot of trauma to the bone, so. Right. <laughs> now, another syndrome that people talk about is radiocapitellar overload syndrome, which is we have chronic valgus injury uh, in the setting of an ulnar collateral ligament tear. Uh, so, uh, Michael, what do you think of this case? A 20-year-old professional baseball player will own a collateral ligament tear. Um, so, I mean, I kind of see edema in the region of the uh, humeral attachment as well as maybe some edema in the sublime tubercle. But and like we talked about that, you know, the arrows pointing to that fat on the T1, and that's kind of, uh, you know, that's effaced. So like you said before, that's it could either be some scarring, okay. some chronic type traction injury. But the ligament itself looks overall intact, I believe. Yeah. So so this is a situation where there's chronic overuse uh, uh, tendinopathy here. We don't have an acute tear, but I believe uh, you're right. I think there is. A bony reactive change here from chronic overuse. There's loss of the, the deep fat pad here, and there's also some uh, sclerosis involving the capitellum over here. And this is someone who is just a chronic uh, uh, thrower. These are all chronic changes that occur, and these people people can develop chronic pain syndromes of the elbow, which can be limiting. And it's thought to be due to instability because they had an injury to the ulnar collateral ligament. It may have torn, but it but it's more less stable than normal, and and you're starting to get these. Uh, now the fat pad sign means that uh, this is uh, a granulation tissue rather than fat. Is that what we're talking about? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So here we have some increased signal intensity within the humeral attachment of the ulnar collateral ligament. It looks like some traction injury. Um, I don't see a tear. There again, we can see the marrow edema. Um, this is a chronic stress injury. Uh, what you see employers. The reason I'm putting these things out is, as we'll talk about in a minute, there are, we can see by MR changes in the bones and soft tissues which occur before you have rupture, which may be a precursor to rupture. And if they're recognized and understood as to what their significance is, these patients can be rested, allow these to heal, and may not go on to a complete rupture or a bony avulsion. So that these are stress reactions, and uh, it's not uncommon that uh, I'll get a referral or we'll get referrals where they talk about a ligament tear or bony stress reaction. And what you're really looking for are these, because these are things where you get back to the surgeon, the, the, the kid's arrested, these will heal in a couple of weeks, and then they can go back and have less risk of uh, failure 
of the of the of the uh, stabilizing structure. In this case, the ulnar collateral ligament. Okay, uh, Ashu. Uh, here you can again see some stress uh, reaction along the sublime tubercle um, there, and the ulnar collateral ligament it seems intact. Yeah, and uh, uh, these are typically seen in teenage uh, pitchers or catchers. And again, these kids typically will have symptoms at this stage, and this is a precursor to a more significant event and should be recognized as, as, uh, as such. And therefore, this may be very helpful in managing these patients because you can't really see these by other modalities. Michael. You know, baseball player with pain for four weeks after throwing. And so we see a significant amount of edema in the sublime tubercle. Yeah. Um, we also see some thickening and increased signal within the distal aspect of the anterior vein and the lower collateral ligament. Like so, it's maybe at least partially torn, but I don't think it's a complete tear. But there's also some edema superficial to it as well. Right. So again, this is another high risk. Okay, great. This is, and then if you go to the sagittal images, which we can see is often this. This is that. This is this edema seen in the sagittal plane. And this is a fairly common place where you can see bone edema in these over, overlying athletes. Uh, the significance of seeing it on the sagittal here and, and not really seeing it well on the coronal, I'm not sure because it's quite common that we'll see a little bit of bone edema right in through here and, and people who don't, aren't, don't clearly have symptoms in that location. Uh, and it, it doesn't extend over to where the older collateral ligament attaches. So I'm still not exactly sure what that signifies, but if it's extensive like this going over to the sublime tubercle, then it's clearly a, a risk factor. Okay. All right, so we have a 17-year-old baseball pitcher with increasing elbow pain. Um, here again, we can see some marrow edema within the sublime tubercle at the attachment of the ulnar collateral ligament, the anterior bundle. And um, I'd like to see the common flexor tendon and also the plain films. Okay. So it looks like a non displaced osseous avulsion injury. What occurs if you don't heed the warning signs of stress reactions is you can go on to, to a fracture. Yeah. Okay. Ashu. This is an art. Uh, would you put that in the category of a stress injury, John, or would you put that in a actually non displaced fracture? I would put this in the category of a non-displaced fracture, but again, yeah. it's just a uh, it's just a matter of degree as to whether you call it a stress injury versus fracture. That these are all injuries to the bone from traction injury from the ulnar collateral ligament. Yeah, but the thing is, this bone has has uh, uh, been severed from um, well. It's a chip, chip fracture, the way I look at it, undisplaced. Yeah, I think it's a non-displaced avulsion fracture is the way I usually word these. Yeah. So this, um, this, this is a cast situation because it's not displaced. It should heal and be no problem. Right. Um, otherwise, you'd have to probably pin it. Yeah. Okay. Issue. So that, yeah. uh, can I say something? Yeah. One of the things that we need to remember that the orthopedic surgeon has to take care of the patient um, after the films are taken, and sometimes he needs to he or she needs to discuss it with the radiologist. How much of a displacement is it, etc. Um, because he has to know what to do with the patient. And um, um, before MRI, we, we used to uh, do things um, a, a lot more 
um, on our own, uh, although I used to like to get opinions from a radiologist at Orthopedic Hospital, Schreiber was that fellow uh, there, and he, and he was a genius in radiology before MRI and CT. Um, but anyway, um, and, and he was a very, very astute guy. Anyway, um, that's what we need to know. Um, do I treat it today or next year or whatever? Uh, and the radiologist has to be able to tell me that. So as radiologists, you, you folks have to be ready to be able to answer that. And that's something very important. Um, we, we want to know what am I going to do with this patient, and I need your help to tell me um, some of the possibilities that I could use. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, okay. Ashu. Um, well, looking at the uh, the medial side here, it looks like there's there's some fluid uh, between the sublime tubercle and the normal expected attachment of the ulnar collateral ligament. So we're concerned for a partial tear, almost like a T sign here. And it looks like it's intact there. So I would I would say partial tear, anterior band, ulnar collateral ligament. That's it. Okay, this patient came in. Is there a concern about a partial tear to the ulnar collateral ligament, Michael? Uh, okay, so is this just a T1 fitted image? Yes, this is just a T1 coronal image. Okay, so and look that similar to the other ones I took, it looks like there's a face under that fat where you'd be deep to the anterior band. Um, and there's some kind of Intermediate signal. Yeah. Uh, proximally is distally. I thought that looks intact. Yeah. So this this kind of blows it up. You can see that there's a little bit of increased signal intensity here uh, distally, and so there's a concern about what to do with this. So contrast in the joint, you'd probably see contrast extending through here. Maybe maybe not, and it could be a T sign. And uh, just be aware that in uh, young people, you typically don't have signal here unless you have uh, a, a partial tear distally. Uh, and, but in older individuals, you know, when you get past the typical athletic ages, it's not uncommon to get degenerative change here at the interface between the articular cartilage and the ulnar collateral ligament attachment. And here we can see that here, which is considered just a normal cleft in, in an older individual. So, and also in older individuals, the ulnar collateral ligament is not such an important structure as it is in a young athlete. So just be aware that if people are hemming and hawing about a little signal here in someone who's who's older, not a 20-year-old athlete, uh, then uh, I, I like to err on the side of it being degenerative change after this particular paper. Uh, this is not a normal ulnar collateral ligament. We've lost the fat uh, sign here, and we can see there's a lot of tendinosis proximally. Uh, but the other images showed that the ulnar collateral ligament was intact in this particular patient. So this I would not call a T-sign. Okay. Okay, so here a 15-year-old pitcher, here we can see, um, looks like T1 contrast signal intensity extending deep to the ulnar collateral ligament at the attachment of the sublime tubercle compatible with a tear. Yeah. So, so this, is, and this would be a, a typical, since you don't have extravasation of contrast and so forth, it's probably a partial tear. That, that really doesn't really matter too much. If they're a young athlete and uh, they're having trouble, pain, and they, their, their function went down, uh, these are typically treated the same way you'd treat a complete tear anyway. So, but uh, so this is the T sign, uh, and uh, they say here that it's uh, it's it's typically abnormal, but it's poorly associated with symptoms and need for surgery. Uh, but uh, that's just the sign itself. But typically, we're doing these uh, in patients who are athletes who actually have the typical symptoms uh, associated with uh, with uh, the throwing elbow. So most of the time when I've seen these, 
the patient has clear-cut symptoms that uh, typically, if they're a young athlete, uh, lead to surgery if they want to continue playing. It's all, it, it's all about stability. Uh, as to uh, the treatment, I think I mentioned that earlier. And in terms of surgery, that's um, uh, usually down the road yeah. if you're going to do it. Uh, unless you can see that the elbow is open, uh, that means that it's uh, definitely uh, something that you need to do early on. Yeah, well, a, uh, a lot of these patients will be grossly stable. Uh, the, the problem in these patients is that they're typically uh, pitchers and they they have decreased control and decreased speed on their pitch pitching arm when they pitch and therefore they're no longer competitive. So a lot of the surgeries here that we're talking about are just for the athletes and they're just to allow them to uh, stay competitive in a highly competitive sport. Oh, I, 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 I'm aware of that. Um, uh, uh, surgery can give them 65% uh, return to pitching in some cases and as high as 85. Yes. So um, it's not 100%. Yeah, but it, and um, there you go. You have to be a little careful about doing these. Um, sometimes a little conservative, conservative treatment and then waiting it out a little bit is a good thing. Okay. Now, soft tissue and marrow edema are associated with symptoms and uh, or a stronger need for surgery uh, in, these, in a lot of these patients. So uh, here we can see this is uh, posterior, uh, a lot of motion here and so forth. Here we can see that there's the at the end the the attachment of the of the ulnar collateral ligament to the sublime tubercle is more anterior, and we can see it's completely avulsed off here and this complete tear. Okay. Yeah, when you see something like that, it's conceivable that you can reattach it, um, possibly. Uh, and that might be something to think about. But I would think that's pretty rare. Yeah. Because of uh, the reconstruction is, is uh, so good. And, uh, uh, I remember, and I'm sure you remember, because you, you gave the lecture, that uh, some parents wanted their kids to have these done uh, in normal elbows so they could uh, improve their abilities, which was, of course, asinine, but uh, they, they did do that, didn't they, John? Yeah, it's, it's not uncommon in Southern California high school students that come in with their parents, uh, the, the kid the coach may tell them that they're just their fastball is just not quite fast enough. If they had another three or four miles per hour, they they would be competitive to go to the next level. And the parents will come in and request a Tommy John procedure, thinking that that will give their child enough added speed on their fastball where they can uh, progress and go into college as, as pitchers. That's not an uncommon request still today. But... Uh, I don't know any surgeons who will do it in that context. Um, you know one that wouldn't do it. I know I know someone who wouldn't do it, right? <laughs> uh, I know a lot. Okay, so here's a patient who has medial pain with pitching. Uh, I forgot who's next. There it's me. Okay, go for it. Um, I, I mean, I, I'm seeing the ulnar collateral ligament here. I see some fluid extending superiorly. Um, I really would have to scroll through this to see um, how far it goes, but it, it looks like there might be a partial tear here. Yeah, that's the, this was an arthrogram. Uh, here's what the T1 fat set post was, and this was actually called a, a partial tear uh, at this particular time. This was actually a minor league baseball player. Uh, a few years ago. Uh, he then got better in a couple of days of just being rested and went back and started pitching again. This is on 3.10.05, and then late in the season in September, he came back with this MR scan. Oh, well, now you can see that the, um, the, distal, uh, the distal anterior band 
ulnar collateral ligament is, is kind of stripped off. I don't know if that edema is extending past the capsule, but this is at least a partial tear anterior band ulnar collateral ligament, this is not more. What do you mean partial? Yeah. This totally looks complete. Right. Yeah. Um, and this was uh, uh, ligamentosis, and uh, now it's uh, a tear. So here we can see we still have a little bit of increased signal intensity proximally, but the signal intensity within the proximal part of the ulnar collateral ligament is very variable in normal people. Uh, it widens out there, and it doesn't typically doesn't always stay black, even in normal people who have had no trauma or athletics. In this particular case, uh, maybe there's a little strain or tendinos uh, ligamentosis, like John said, uh, but now we can see that there's a complete tear here. And uh, 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 never forget, um, guys and girls, uh, pictures are not normal. Yeah, right. their, their anatomy is not normal. Uh, uh, from the beginning to the end yeah. of, of pitching. Um, they're totally different uh, uh, human being from the rest of us, uh, their anatomy, et cetera. Yeah. Okay, Michael, what do you think of this one? Ulnar collateral tear arthrogram. So we see on the arthrogram, we see contrast to, um, somewhat extending inferiorly, and and it's kind of going down in the muscle as well. So that's indicative kind of that T sign in the ulnar collateral ligament tear. Now, I really do not like doing arthrograms in patients who have acute injuries, and this is kind of one of the reasons why. So the question is, is this a tear of the muscle? Or, or is it infiltration of like the injection or something? Exactly. And that can be a significant problem in these people because uh, the, the, the whole uh, course and expectations for when the patient can go back to play may depend upon whether it's extravasation of contrast or an actual tear of the muscle. Uh, this actually was extravasation of contrast. We can kind of see... Uh, uh, here, but but remember, if you get uh, tears of the muscle and you get hemorrhage, they can be bright on T1 weighted images. So it can often be difficult to differentiate the two. So I just uh, recommend that uh, if if you're dealing with people with acute injuries, uh, try not to do a lot of arthrography because it can make the pic the picture much more confusing. Uh, uh, sometimes you have to bring the patient back a few hours later uh, when hemorrhage would still look the same, but the, a lot of the gadolinium would be resorbed. I, I think in my career, I asked for one arthrogram, and I was sorry I did. Oh, <laughs> right. Okay. And that was in a shoulder, and uh, he was a mutual patient of ours, John. Oh, really? And that was, I, I asked for it in the desert, so it had nothing to do with you in terms of me asking, right. but uh, I, I I felt bad about it ever since. Oh, no. A professional golfer. Right, right. Yeah. All right. So here it looks like the distal aspect of the ulnar collateral ligament is intact, but there's fluid signal intensity proximally at the humeral attachment. Um, I'm concerned about high-grade tearing. This is a rich substance, too. Uh, yeah, again, if these are athletes and they decide on surgery, the, the surgery for these is pretty much grafts at this point. But I'm sure people already have and probably will uh, more coming up. We'll be looking at if it's a distal insertional tear. I'm sure people will be looking at ways to maybe uh, uh, repair those and put in internal uh, uh, braces in them. Uh, because there's there's kind of a big push, as you you know, from the Curl and Job lectures, for people to to start doing that and trying to maintain the uh, more normal anatomy. But these mid substance tears, that's probably not going to be the case uh, to, to do that. These would have to be repaired by grafts. So that's uh, you can suture them up and um, add a graft to it, John. Um, the main thing is. Uh, to let it heal without getting a stiff elbow. Right. 
the maximum you can keep an elbow immobilized is uh, between like three or two, six weeks. And, um, and then it's, a, it's a, a waiting period that's pretty anxious. Yeah. Okay, Hashu. All right, so um, this is a, looks like a fairly younger uh, patient. There's quite a bit of edema, I think, in the sublime tubercle um, uh, on the left image, um, maybe even some cystic changes at the attachment of the ulnar collateral ligament, but um, it looks intact. Um, I don't know. But it's thickened here. It's thick. It's, yeah, it's quite a bit thickened. Um, okay. It's just a stress injury. Um, uh, tug, tug lesion. Yeah. I, I like the word tug. It's simple, T-U-G. So this is June of 2008. The patient came back now February of 2009. Okay, and now you can see that there's a, a increased signal at the uh, humeral attachment and ulnar collateral ligament there. Um, and there's a face, and probably, I mean, if I saw the T1s, probably a facement of the fat there too. And um, uh, stress injuries resolve there. Yeah. And so this was a partial tear. And the way these typically tear, they start posteriorly and tear anteriorly in the proximal area. Uh, so this was a partial tear of the proximal. And if, on the sagittal images, uh, this is what it looked like at 62708. They kind of black all through here. And on 2209, we can see that there's this partial tear of the posterior attachment of the ulnar collateral ligament uh, coming off the medial epicondyle. And all that should be avoided. Okay. Okay, Michael. Okay, 15 year baseball pitcher. So it looks like there's at least a partial tear of the proximal aspect of the ulnar collateral ligament. I certainly see kind of an edema in through here. Yeah. No. But I don't see like a you know sharp fluid signal or saying to say there's a full thickness tear. Okay, this is on 12109. 12109. This is uh, now uh, a couple years later. A couple years later, it looks like there's more edema also within the bone and at that interface. So like continuing chronic, you know, tearing and lesion. Exactly. So this is just a proximal, a, a progressive proximal ulnar collateral ligament avulsion uh, in situations like this. And it's a good idea to get a plain film in a situation like this because you can often see the, the bony injury better on the plain film sometimes. But this is, a, again, a chronic overuse injury uh, involving the uh, avulsion of the proximal ulnar collateral ligament from the medial epicondyle. Too many tugs. Here we go. Okay, so here we can see some increased signal intensity within the proximal aspect of the ulnar collateral ligament. And there is some slight cortical irregularity there and surrounding edema and fluid. I'm not sure if this may also be traction injury or if there could be an ossific fragment there's an impaction or some type of acute trabecular injury there in the medial epicondyle lateral epicondyle um valgus injury to the elbow this is more acute okay uh, other signs to look for in injuries to the ulnar collateral ligament uh, ashu what do you think of this one Um, well, you can see some, I, I would say some ossification within the ulnar collateral ligament. I don't know if this is a prior avulsion um, or heterotopic ossification. So, so uh, Frank Job a few years ago told me that in his experience, about 15% of Major League Baseball pitchers have an ossicle in their ulnar collateral ligament, which is certainly higher than the regular population. And I, I think this is similar to the development of ligament and tendon ossicles we've seen elsewhere, which are often called normal variants or congenital lesions. But, but I think these really start as partial tears. 
uh, get a little hemorrhage, then it heals with calcification and then ossification. And I think that's true of the osperineum. We've, we've seen a lot of these throughout the body looking for it. I think usually an indication of prior trauma. Yes, John. I, I, I think you're 100% correct, John. And um, uh, ossicles and osteophytes. Yeah. Uh, that's uh, uh, pictures uh, cannot do without them. Yeah. And maybe there's a little bony avulsion here, but the vast majority of these are actually embedded in the mid substance of the. Uh, of the ligament, and if you see them in 15 percent of major league. Well, if uh, John, if, if it was an avulsion, uh, that elbow would have been totally unstable. Right. Yeah. Because uh, the ossicle is way too far, so uh, it would have been a loose elbow. Fortunately for the elbow, like I said, on the medial side is 50 percent bone and cartilage stability of the rest capsule and ligaments. Uh, but uh, in this situation, that ossicles way down there, so that's blood yeah. clot and, and, and ossification. Yeah, and I think what goes along with this, it, it may be present in 15% of Major League Baseball pitchers, but it's basically present in close to 0% of the rest of the population. So uh, that yeah. makes trauma. Good. Okay, I forgot. Who, who's next? Uh, Michael, are you next? Maybe. Um, all right. So MLB pitcher. So that ulnar collateral ligament looks markedly thickened. It almost looks like there's like ossification along it. Yeah. Okay. So this is taking that that uh, mid substance ossicle to the extreme, where you're really getting ossification of the vast majority of the ulnar collateral ligament. Again, from uh, uh, the mechanism, I think it's the mechanism that we just talked about. And is that any abnormality with their capitellum, or is that just the slice selection? Uh, we're too far posteriorly. Uh, if you go posteriorly in the capitellum beyond the articular cartilage, it's normally irregular like this. That's what I thought. That was uh, that's often been called an abnormality in the past. Yeah. It's uh, the bare area posteriorly there, and. Uh, we will talk about that later and, and how to look for it. That's why it's important on these to always look at this area on the sagittal images where it's uh, more clear that it's just a variant. And when we did our study of 180 asymptomatic elbows, having cysts back in this area and irregularity was quite common in asymptomatic elbows. I, I wonder how much um, the recurrent immobilization um, uh, helps produce these um, calcifications of the ligaments. I don't know. Uh, it makes sense. You know, intermittent the immobilizations and, and activity, immobilization, activity, et cetera. Yeah. And then injections and so on. Yeah. This is uh, pretty old stuff here. Yeah. So here I'll more. In terms of uh, when, it, when the treatment was performed on this uh, individual. Yeah. How, how, how old is this case, John, you know? Uh, this, I believe, was a Major League Baseball pitcher. So he was probably in his 20s. Uh, so he'd, he'd probably been pitching for, for uh, well, 10 years, more. Probably 20 years or so. Maybe, yeah, he could have been 30. Yeah. yeah, but in I, I think anybody that um, has pitched for 20, 30 years will not show a normal elbow. Absolutely. Uh, None of them are normal. That's right. I, I, I've never seen a case that was normal, and i never seen a case that could fully extend their elbow. I think we'll talk about that later. Yeah, most Major League Baseball pitchers can extend their non-dominant elbow, but they can't extend the, the pitching elbow. And we'll go through why that's the case. And then here we can see important to get the fluid sensitive images because this patient actually had a proximal tear of the ulnar collateral ligament here that you can see best with the fluid sensitive images. And we can see the displaced ossicles there. And this just shows the tear in the sagittal plane. So I, I like to look at everything in the sagittal plane. So in an old injury, 
but on top of that, he had an acute tear, proximal tear of the ulnar collateral ligament. Okay. So here it looks like there's another ossicle near the proximal aspect of the ulnar collateral ligament. Um, just so this is an older individual who had acute trauma. Okay. So this could reflect a remote injury. There's a lot of fluid signal intensity along the radial collateral ligament proximally, so I wonder if he had some type of varus injury. And yes, fracture. It looks like there's marrow edema in the radius, and there's cortical step off, so he may have a fracture of the radius too. So this is not a ligament, but this patient had an, an acute fracture of the radial head. And that could be acute too, couldn't it? it, 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 it uh, your jaw. And the radial neck fracture. Yeah, this is acute. Yeah. This one, I'm not sure it's possible it could be acute even without edema here, because with traction injuries, you don't always get a lot of edema. But if that were the case, I would expect at least some soft tissue edema. So I suspect that this is probably chronic and this is acute. Yeah, that that's kind of what I figured, John. But on the medial side, I'm not going to comment because yeah. my expertise here is not that great. Uh, Ashley, what do you think of this case? All right, so 42-year-old female with left elbow pain for one year, uh, had a steroid injected four times, uh, had a surgical release, um, um, extensor carpi radialis brevis and longus tenderness, and um, radial collateral ligament rupture versus varus stability, uh, instability. Sorry. Um, and it looks like along the um, lateral aspect of the elbow, we see some uh, fluid signal um, uh, along the humeral aspect there. It looks like detachment. Um, I, I would say that there's at least a, 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 a pretty big tear there um, of the uh, yeah. of the extensor uh, tendon mechanism. Yeah, it's a common extensor tendon tear. Yeah, yeah. A lot of hemorrhage in the uh, area around it. <clears throat> Yes, and they went in at surgery. In this particular case, so let's let me go back for a second here. We can look at this. Okay, so, so there's clearly a tear of the uh, of the uh, part of the common extensor tendon. Probably the, this is part of the ECRB. Uh, the the radial collateral ligament may be intact here. A little hard to say. But it looks like the here it looks like that radial collateral ligament may may be intact. The communis looks like it's mostly intact, so this looks like it's primarily an ECRB injury. I don't know why I put this here, not in the other section. And here we can see much more injury back there. And then I'd like to try to go back further and actually see the lateral ulnar collateral ligament, which I don't know if we're seeing it here. I'm not exactly sure on these images, but they, they took this patient to surgery here, put in some graft and an operation. The radial collateral ligament was intact, but in this particular case, there's a complete rupture of the lateral ulnar collateral ligament, and they put a graft in uh, to replace the lateral ulnar collateral ligament. That, 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 that's the most important one um, for whatever um, importance it has. Not that much. But okay, why don't we stop here and we'll continue on then on Thursday? Okay, thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Well, have a good evening, everybody. Yeah, thank just you. a quick question. Yes, um, if you have a lateral ulnar collateral ligament, uh, lateral ulnar collateral ligament tear, um, is that um, very obvious clinically? Uh, it certainly can be because it goes right to the ulna from the uh, from the radius. So it's it, it, the ulna in that area. If you feel it in your in your arm, you 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 can feel the ulna there. It goes all the way down to that to, um, to the edge of the ulna. That, that's all, all you have is subcutaneous tissue, and then muscle uh, above it.
but uh, I, I, above the bone and not, not, not the subcutaneous tissue, obviously. But if you have acute tears of the lateral ulnar collateral ligament, you usually also get injuries to the surrounding capsule, which allows enough motion to tear the lateral yeah. collateral ligament, and it's associated with instability at that point. Yeah, they all go together. That, that that's one area that uh, that uh, we talked about uh, and the anatomy. The anatomy in this area is very very important in terms of what's torn and what's not, etc., and what kind of treatment you get. Um, on the radial side, the surgery is not that common, uh, other than for epicondylitis, so-called. But uh, that, that, that's many times just a, a scratch around operation okay. and create creating scar. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. All right. No, that, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. I hope I answered your question. But yes, you, thank can, you. you can feel that uh, area. You you cannot feel that ligament, but you can feel that area where that ligament uh, uh, goes to. Okay. 